dear beautiful followers welcome back to my channel pilot alexander for a new series incident accident analysis this is the first episode of this series if you watch it like it share it and of course subscribe to my channel we will certainly expand these episodes to new incidents and accidents and see what happened in these events learn from them and certainly become better pilots In today's video, we are going to talk about a real incident which happened on board an Airbus A320. The crew composed of the captain and the first officer was flying on a beautiful sunny day. The captain was pilot monitoring and the senior first officer was pilot flying. Both pilots are very experienced and this has its importance for the upcoming event. Before takeoff checklist completed, the crew is clear to line up. Once the takeoff clearance is given to them, the FO sets the parking brake to off and moves the thrust levers forward. The FO then removes his left hand from the thrust levers to allow the captain to place his right hand on the engine controls. Note that for this particular stage of the flight, there is no more pilot flying and pilot monitoring, but rather Commander 1, CM1, and Commander 2, CM2. As if an incident happened before V1, it is the CM1 authority to stop the aircraft on the runway. We will get back to this later. The pilot flying is supposed to look at the flight mode annunciator, FMA, and read what he sees as it is a confirmation of the selections he makes. During this takeoff, the FO said loudly, Manflex 40, SRS, runway, autotrust, blue. Manual flex degree is selected, SRS runway are active, autotrust is armed. The airplane slowly picked up the speed on the runway. But just before reaching 40 knots, Master caution, the ECAM was indicating engine thrust levers not set. Thrust levers, MCT flex. Immediately, the Commander 1 realizes what just happened and decided to retard the thrust levers to idle. While gently using the brake pedals to slow the aircraft down on the runway, he let the aircraft smoothly run to the next exit, which is on the right, and in consultation with the Commander 2, decides to vacate the runway. CM2 then contacted the tower to tell them that the takeoff had been rejected, and their intention is to simply vacate the runway and join the taxiway to the holding point for another takeoff. Airbus Simulator 123 stopping on the runway. Copied 123. Do you require any assistance? No, thank you very much. It is not necessary. Request to join the taxiway and stop there. We will certainly attempt a new takeoff in a few minutes. Airbus Simulator 123. Copied 123. Turn right on Alpha and hold. Turning right on Alpha and uh, holding. Airbus Simulator 123. Thank you. The crew vacated the runway. Took a few seconds to analyze what happened to them. Then breathe in, breathe out. They made the performance calculation again. They once more made the before takeoff checklist before asking for a new takeoff clearance. They took off and reached their destination without any problem. Now you're certainly asking yourself these questions. What happened? Did the FO do any mistake? Why did the captain reject the takeoff? Was it the correct decision or was there another better one perhaps? Well, let's analyze what happened. While moving the thrust levers forward, the first officer did not go all the way to flex MCT as he was supposed to for the takeoff, but instead set the levers to the climb detent. We Airbus pilots are used to hear two clicks while taking off, at least. The first one passing the climb detent click and the second one reaching flex MCT or passing flex MCT to Toga. This is a typical scenario of a normal human rule-based error, also called procedural decision error. Remember, 
we fly the airplane applying procedures, thus not applying the correct procedure at the right time has a direct impact on upcoming events and could be more dangerous than a skill-based error or a knowledge-based error. The part of the brain called cerebellum oversees the process of the procedural memory. The prefrontal cortex and the parietal cortex are also included into this operation. But that is not all. Remember, the first officer read loudly Manflex 40, SRS, Runway, Autotrust, Blue, although it was never displayed on the FMA because he simply did not set the thrust levers to flex MCT. So how did he read something that was never written? Well, this is a typical confirmation bias error where your brain shows you what you want and expect to see, although it never happened. The first officer could probably swear he saw the indication on the FMA, but it never happened. It was just his brain playing a trick on him. The posterior medial prefrontal cortex contributes to this mistake. Now the question. The pilots are two in the cockpit. So how did the captain not see the thrust levers at the correct position, although he has his right hand on it? We can also think that he expected the FO to do the correct actions as he's flying with an experienced first officer after all, and he probably and obviously trust him. Captain did not look at the PFD while the FO was reading the FMA or surely looked at it after. Let us review the threat and error management theory. Applying the correct procedures with effective communication between the crew members and cross-checking each other actions would keep the flight at a safe operational state. If any of these conditions are not met, a threat can arise. If the threat is managed properly, the flight will go back to a state of safe operations. But if the threat is not detected and immediately corrected, the situation evolves to become an error. If the error is quickly managed, the flight will go back to a safe operational state. But if the error is left to furthermore development, the flight reaches an undesired aircraft state. One more option is left at this moment managing the undesired aircraft state immediately to go back to safe operations or risk the incident or accident. One could argue that this incident has evolved to an undesired aircraft state, but I personally do not think so, as they were on the runway. Cleared for takeoff, the aircraft did not accelerate over 40 knots Thus, the auto brake was not activated and the reversers not used. A very interesting question we could ask ourselves. On a 4,000 meters plus runway with an Airbus A320, knowing that the aircraft did not overpass the touchdown aiming point markings at 400 meters only from the threshold of the runway, could the captain decide for example, to push the thrust levers forward to toga and take off anyway, avoiding wasting time getting out of the runway. How important it is to mention that we are not superheroes. We are pilots and as pilots, our objective is to fly the aircraft safely from a point A to a point B. It is not to bet if our ideas would work or not and take unnecessary risks. I think the captain took the best decision. Leave, breathe, concentrate and fly again. Yes, this may have cost an extra 10 minutes, but it is better to be safe than sorry and jeopardize 150 lives, not mentioning the material loss. Guess what? The captain was fired anyway as the company he worked for blamed him for not pushing the trust levers forward to Toga and take off. I can assure you, knowing them, that if he took off directly, he would be fired anyway for not having taken his time. Unfortunately, for certain companies, firing the employees seems to be the only solution. 
the solution for everything. It is their own weird way of managing the threats and the errors, instead of learning from these mistakes so it won't occur again in the future. Fire the problem and pretend it never existed. Then you will be seen as a great manager. What a shame, what a shame. Okay guys, I hope you liked the first episode. Thank you very much for flying with me. See you soon. Cheers.